It is a very bright and sunny Monday morning, and I slept through my occupational therapy appointment. I have another one scheduled now at 1.30, but in the meantime, I'm sitting here listening to The Archaeology of Mind by Yak Pongsep. It's all about emotions and how they arise in different structures in the lower brain. I don't like that term, lower or higher, but that's what they say. Anyway, I have a lot of emotions and also a lack of emotions regarding my decision yesterday to pull the plug on the world championships. It was the right decision because the more that I try to organize the trip, the more I realize that it was going to create so much financial hardship that whatever benefit I got wasn't going to be worth it. The costs exceeded the benefit. So, yeah, but now I have this sense of emptiness in front of me. I don't get to test the results of a thousand hours of training last year or two years with over 1900 hours. And uh, that's okay. This project for me and how I go about living now is not about results. It's not about finish lines. It's more about curiosity. I'm still curious, I'm still going to train, I'm still going to take steps, but I simply have to point myself in a new direction. And a thought that occurred to me this morning is that I could chase that Strava CR that I lost to Johnny Hagenbach, uh, prospect. Um, he's one of the best skiers in the country, one of the top junior skiers in the world, and if I can get closer to that time okay that's a demonstration of fitness i'm more of a long distance guy than a sprinter and that really would be a sprint but let's see how good i can get at sprint speed uh, yeah maybe i can find another race to jump into another long one i like the longer stuff i like being able to v2 for long periods of time that felt good yesterday when I could V2. Um, I don't know, we'll see. In the meantime, I'm gonna head upstairs and take some gentle steps and, and uh, whatever emotions arise related to the disappointment of not going, just be gentle with them, nurture them, and keep myself physically engaged. Uh, as I get to work. Oh no, they put some furniture out across the street again. I don't need any more furniture, but that looks like a really nice piece. I gotta go check it out, maybe disassemble it. That is solid oak, really nice. Old oak unit, man, way too heavy. Um, yeah, ah. Oh. <laughs> Today's PT exercise I call the frozen hitchhiker. You make a loop like that. I put my thumb in the hole and try to raise it up. Oh, that's hard, that burns. And then you make another loop. Put your thumb in and try to raise it up. Oh, that hurts. That was an interesting ski. One, because I saw Leah Davison, and it's always fun to see Leah. Got a great bright smile, and she's just such an extraordinary athlete. And my heart was doing some weird stuff. The impact from the pole in my chest yesterday. I want to be careful. It didn't feel good. I did a couple pickups to test it, and my heart did not want to be elevated. So, calling it at 25 minutes, head back to the studio, maybe do some elliptical, nice and easy, see how that feels. But I want to, I want to be smart. Um, yeah, I. That pole hit was so hard and it just threw me straight back in an instant. Um, so I'm sure my heart got shaken pretty badly. 
Um, yeah. I'm getting into town pretty late today. Didn't sleep well last night due to the crazy wind that was shaking the house and making all kinds of noise and knocking things around. And uh, it sounded like somebody was banging on the door at like 4.30 in the morning. So I got up with one of my butter knives and went to the door and it was the snow shovels had blown off of their holder and were like bouncing on the door. Um, yeah, I was all ready for a confrontation. Anyway, then I went back to sleep and just zonked out. So I'm sitting here in the car listening to The Archaeology of Mind by Yak Punksep and Lucy Bevan. And it's really good. I've been avoiding this book for a while because it's 27 hours long. And I thought it was written a long time ago. I thought it was going to be old because Yak Pongsep has been doing incredible research for decades, but it's up to date. So I'm loving it. I finished Joseph Burgo's Shame on the way home from Lake Placid. Uh, and that was good. Four star book. Not great, but good review going up on Patreon soon. And uh, this book I'm enjoying even more. It's all about the seven core effective networks in the brains of all mammals, including us. And uh, yeah, I like it. All right, gonna listen for a little bit more, watch the snow coming down and head upstairs and get to work. Little Amish buggy and some horsies. Poor horsies. God, look at their steaming. You guys are steaming. What you doing? Sorry, you're tied up to a post. I'm just getting back from Dollar Tree where I got a pack of 10 ballpoint pens, a pack of four balloon sticks, but there's actually eight tubes in the pack because you stick them together to make them longer. And I got a plant holder, which is a metal S. And the tools I'm going to use to make the maple tap are needle nose pliers and a heat gun, but you could use a blow dryer just as well. So the first thing we're going to do is take the pen apart and we're going to keep them, the parts, because we may use some of them after. And the needle nose pliers are to get the bottom of the pen out and we're going to save that for later use. After you take the pen apart, I'm going to heat it up with the heat gun, but not too much. Maybe 15, 20 seconds. So the reason that I'm heating up the pen is so that I can put it on this S-hook. So softened it up with the heat gun and then just kind of roll it around this S. And there we go. That's pretty good. That's a nice angle. Now we're going to use the heat gun again in this position to soften it so that it'll stay here because right now there's a lot of tension. So when I take it off the S, it's just going to flex right back. So maybe 30 seconds of heat gun to melt it in this shape and then I'll let it cool before taking it off the S. All right, now I'm gonna let it cool. I let it cool for about five minutes and we will take it off of here and see what we get. And that is a good angle. So basically the tap is going to be going into the tree at an angle and then we want the spout to come straight down. So that is perfect. And the reason I put the S in there is when I bent the tube, I didn't want it to flatten out at the curve. If I just heat it up and tried to bend it, it would pinch and get flat right in there. 
so the S gave it some stability on the inside, so the tube remains open all the way through. All right, now we take our tap. So this is the tap that's going into the tree. And this is a nice tight pressure fit, which is exactly what I want. And there we go. So this part goes in the tree and this part will go down into a bucket. The reason that I saved the pen parts is that this cap is absolutely perfect, obviously, for capping off the pen to keep little creatures and dirt out of there when you're storing these for next year. And the bottom piece, I'm gonna put in upside down. So I'm gonna put the large round piece in there first like that and it makes a nice cap so this is sealed for storage and again 10 pens for a buck 25 eight tubes for a buck 25 and this s was a buck 25 so for three dollars and 75 cents i can make eight maple taps not bad I'm using a 5 16 drill bit because that's the standard cap size and I'm gonna put it in at an angle. Then I take the ballpoint pen, which is shoved into the balloon holder and work it into the hole. It's a nice pressure fit. Then I took a grape juice bottle that I had finished, drilled a 5 16 hole in the cap and that will fit perfectly on the tube. And then just slide that in, seat it in the snow. So here's my homemade maple tap. We salvaged an old stove from the dump. It's rusty, one of the legs was broken, but we fixed it, got it out here between the wood piles. Got a big pan at Goodwill and we boil it down. I love this style of building. Very cozy. My heart is still a little iffy, so I just skewed for an hour, and I had a thought. There's a race in Maine, the Rangeley Moppet. It's a 50 kilometer skate race, and I think I will put that on my calendar in place of the world. It's pretty competitive, um, and that gives me something to work towards, and uh, I won't feel like the season has just kind of evaporated on me. For dinner, coleslaw, broccoli, potatoes, and smart ground with veggies. Looks like they got some more snow on the mountain last night. Can't wait to get up and check it out. Wait, oh, look at you, look at you. Come on, come say hi. Come say hi, there you go. This is what she just flushed out. I think they call a white one an ermine. The ermine, look yep. at it. It's going right okay. to it. Oh no. So that's not just a, a change in the winter or no? I, oh, it got something. Look at that. Yeah, you got a mouse. You oh, got a mouse. Wow. We got the 55 plus club again today yeah, with our first ermine sighting. Yeah. Skied up the mountain with the boys and now we've got to ski down. Beautiful day. The way we go. Two men or possibly three looking to join the leader of the moment. Alderson, Shadow, Clamo, Northwood in, in semi final number one. Wow, that is going to be a hot beat. Did some pretty intense polling. That last 10 minutes at B2 was tough. And the triceps uh, using the pole straps and just working the bottom half also. It's a burner. And then some knees to bar. Feels good. That, uh, that felt like a workout. Wasn't intentional, but feels good. Good morning. I am just finishing a 20 minute listening session to the archeology span of mind. And 
thinking a lot about movement and emotion. Uh, he's talking about the different subcortical circuits in the brain that give rise to affect or the, the felt experience of something underneath our emotional appraisal. And this is something I spend a lot of time experimenting with and thinking about. Like today is a good example. It's rainy, gray, I didn't sleep last night, snow and ice was falling off the roof and it kept smashing into my wall and waking me up and and I still have the uh, upper respiratory issues, sinuses, coughing up stuff, etc. And not feeling great this morning. It's one of those days, moments, I don't call it a day yet because it's just a moment at this point, where being awake is not all that pleasant. I'm getting things done, I'm moving, I got wood, I got sap, uh, did my morning chores, but not feeling empowered yet. And I may not, I may feel compromised for the rest of the day, I don't know, but I keep experimenting throughout the day when I feel like this. I keep engaging in small movements. Uh, to try to stimulate other networks in the brain that will produce different affect, <laughs> different felt experience. So that's a, a big part of my process and my work is to just keep testing, keep questioning, rather than to create a story of, yeah, I feel like crap today. I'm not going to do anything. I don't feel like doing anything. I don't want to have a, a bigger cognitive narrative appraisal. I want to keep asking questions throughout the day. I'm not ready to give up yet. I'm not even ready to have a day yet. Elevator. Stairs. Elevator. Stairs. Oh, I don't know. Let's just run an experiment. Let's on a test what happens if I oh okay not easy but there we go we're in motion yep okay I think we're good we can do this not so bad take our time there's a new sign on the door interesting I wonder if there have been miners running around causing all kinds of havoc it is going to be a very foggy ski today. Wow. I can hear people talking, but I can't see them. <laughs> it is a very bright and sunny Friday morning. I'm listening to the archaeology of mind uh, as I sit here and talking about addictive substances and the different... Um, networks in the brain that process, uh, or should I say, create the affect that makes drugs addictive. And uh, yeah, new angle, this book. I really like it, a lot of great detail. I've been spending the last few hours preparing for a talk that I'm about to give to the Bennington Rotary Club about a compassionate approach to goal achievement. I have no idea what's gonna come out of my mouth. We will find out shortly. <laughs> I get to check out the old carriage barn behind a big mansion that they tore down in the 70s to build this beautiful Elks Club. I've never been in the carriage barn. Let me clear, to just shut the door, I, I'll come back and lock it after I dump this stuff in there. And I use athletics as a stage, not for myself, not to demonstrate what I can do, but to demonstrate the processes that I use to do it. Because they're processes that anyone, well, almost anyone can employ. And that's really what I'm up to. How do we empower people, not to achieve their best, but simply to be empowered in their lives and in their bodies daily? 
not wait for some big event that we all work so hard for, and then maybe we get the result, maybe we don't. And it's not even about athletics. This is something that applies to everything that you do in life. We all set goals. We all have dreams or desires or missions or plans. And how we go about achieving them or framing them, how we view that process, makes all the difference. Not even whether you achieve it, but whether you grew along the way, whether it was worthwhile regardless of the result. Remember? About three, four inches of super heavy, dense, wet snow. Not fun to shovel. It's 11.30 and I'm finally done with shoveling and wood and sap. And now I'm going to head into work and listen to The Archaeology of Mind, which I'm looking forward to. I love this book. So much good information. And then some writing. Today's going to be a writing day. The talk that I gave yesterday really opened up some new avenues for me to think within and it's exciting. So I'm going to work on a TED talk, which will expand into a book. Got another nine inches of snow. And it's looking really good. We got over two feet on the ground now. I've got a special guest today. This is Sproul Love from Manhattan. We just skied about 5K together and had a nice chat. And Sproul is my inspiration for getting back into skiing. So he is the man responsible for this. So Sproul, I know you from stair climbing, and that's when I heard that you used Nordic skiing for your stair climbing, and you basically were crushing everybody. <laughs> so how do you think cross-country skiing played in your stair climbing success? You know, I don't know which way it went, mm. if the stair climbing supported my skiing or skiing supported my stair climbing, but it's basically the same muscle groups of course, you know, different distances, the stair races are much shorter, but uh, I think unbeknownst to many, stair climbing is full body. Yeah. You're pulling hard with your upper body. You're using the major movers, your glutes and hams and quads. And I've had some of my best ski races, you know, days after Empire State run up. Um, I think they're, it's very compatible training. The stair climbing is obviously your uh, high intensity, yeah. you know, <laughs> understatement, <laughs> uh, over threshold work. And, you know, I would do my longer intervals on roller skis that same week, you know, days before a stair race. So um, I think it's a great change of pace. As you know, stair workouts are soul crushing. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, maybe you do two of them a week and you talk to the best people in the world and they'll, they're not doing more than two a week and you got other days of training and roller skiing is a great way to get in distance. And I can't run on flat ground. I haven't done that in a long time. So it's kind of perfect for me. And, and, uh, yeah, I mean, a day like today, I'd rather be on the skis. Yeah. Yeah. So when I got back into skiing again, especially this past year and I started doing a lot of strength training, I realized this is a very similar motion to pulling on the rails, the new V2 technique. Now I'm thinking of getting back into stair climbing. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, we, I uh, was interviewed about stair climbing by a Norwegian radio personality. Huh. And my question for him was, can we get Petter Northug Ooh, wow. into the Empire State yes. Building race? This was years ago when he was still racing. Yeah. Because of course, I think he would be pretty good. Yeah. Maybe skiers are too heavy, you know, at 80, 85 kilos. Yeah. Uh, I know at 70 kilos, I was always the fat cow of stair climbing. You know, those guys, the top guys are 10, 15 kilos lighter. Well, Jesse Berg and Thomas Dold were both pretty muscular. Yeah, but you know. They yeah, might be the exception. Like Lubnitsky, yeah. he's the best ever, seven time in a row, like World Cup champion and multiple Esber champ, Eiffel Tower record holder. You know, he's lighter than me. He's taller than me, but yeah. he's like five kilos lighter. He's real skinny. And then, um, you know, the Colombian champ, he was, God, 60 kilos, 58. So. Yeah, wow. Well. I'm sure a skier would be a great stair climber, uh, but, you know, they're not 
climbing inside of buildings when they can make millions of dollars running around out on these trails. Yeah, yeah. Well, it'd be kind of a novelty. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Like a lot of Olympic rowers have gotten into stair climbs. And again, similar muscle groups yeah. to skiing, and the rowers seem to do pretty well. Yeah, I mean, there's no hiding on the stairs. It's There's no break. You have to be very smart about pacing and uh, its a capacity. And I think more than people think, it's a strength race. Yes. Like, you need to be strong. Yeah. yeah. Now, you are 51 now. Yeah. And I think you broke the record in the Willis Tower, formerly Sears Tower, for you, those of you that don't know the Willis. In your mid-40s? Did you? Is that so true? So it was 2011. Okay. I had just turned 40. 40, okay. Um, and I actually had been out of stair racing for five or six years. Um, and that, I grew up in St. Louis, so that, along with the Met Tower in St. Louis, yeah. which is not as well known, yeah. the Sears Willis Tower was always kind of my home course. It was one of the first air races I ever did. And I remember uh, an Austrian kid setting the record there, and I really set my mind to breaking that and trained. Matthias Jan was for that? that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And... Um, you know, it's funny. That's one of my most memorable races. I was a total nobody, you know. Well, we knew who you were. I mean, <laughs> somebody was videoing me after and they said, do you know Sproul Love? And I said, I'm Sproul Love. <laughs> um, so I had been out of the sport, but, uh, you know, <clears throat> that race, I had even splits. And it's wow. just a testament to yeah. discipline Not in a stair race. Not going too hard. Yeah, you really, you know, I was just, I had my splits on, written on my arm and just, hit them to within two or three seconds so wow now what was your time it was 1303 1303 God. it's since been broken what <laughs> uh and this um the indonesian kid do you know his name okay yeah i've been reading about him he yeah. ran 1220 so 12 he obliterated it but he is a he's what? a full-time ski God. racer and he's also not 40 so okay, yeah you know i'll take it wow that just blows my mind. Let's I think, see how he does at 40, right? Yeah, I think I did a 1404. <laughs> it, Willis was never my building. I mean, that's a brutal, it's a brutal yeah. climb. It's one of the longest Yeah, it's 20 uh, floors too much for me. Yeah, it's <laughs> one of the longest in the world. And until they start doing stair races again in the, you know, super towers yeah. in Asia, I mean, it remains yeah. one of the longest races. Yeah, 103 there. floors, right? Yep. Yeah, that's a monster. Wow. Okay, are you still stair racing? Any on the horizon? I did. I've done Esbrew the last two years, okay. you know, rolled the dice, didn't yep. get COVID after doing those. Were you in the, I don't know, did they still do two waves, regular wave and master's an wave? Elite, well, they do an elite wave. Okay. Um, How many I people? I was in the elite wave. It's always about 11 or 12 Oh, so much people. smaller than when I was doing um, it. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, I was around my time from 1999, which feels like a victory. I wasn't as fast as I wanted to be, but um, it's tough to turn down a bib yeah, at yeah, Esbrew yeah. and talk about home courses. So yeah, I'll probably do it again. And now it's in October, which is much more compatible with cross-country ski racing. It okay. used to be in May. I'm going to train for it. Uh, come on down, <laughs> yeah. Would uh, So... You did it at 50 years old, I assume? So I did it uh, just in October at 51. Okay, at 51. Yeah. And what was your time? So I was 12, uh, 12 15, I okay. think. That's solid. Which really is solid. Yeah. It's, it's within five seconds of my time in 99 when I first did it yep. at, you know, 20, whatever. So that felt good. Yeah, low 12s is <laughs> a solid time. I I'm think... looking to break 12. I want to get back okay. into the 11s. Yeah, my best ever is 11.38, and uh -huh. that was most of my times are in the, like, 12.05, 12.02. Yeah. So only once under 12. It's, Damn, and you did that at 51. That's incredible. Oh, <laughs> thank you. And I'm, you know what I'm talking about because <laughs> yeah, you've done the race. So have, yes. that, that means a lot. Oh, man, that's beastly. All right, so ski training. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're my inspiration, man. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Saturday is coming to a close and I'm feeling pretty wiped out. I never really bounced back from the sickness that hit me. So I'm going to call it a night. I was going to do some polling and some elliptical, but I'm just going to take it easy and uh, do some work on the computer. Anyway, give myself a little bit of rest. Can't push if you're not feeling it. So I'm not being pulled into anything, and I'm just going to honor that. 
All right, see you tomorrow. Dinner is a big salad mixed with broccoli and some spinach fettuccine. Just finishing up a polling session to the men's skiathlon at the World Championships. Simon Kruger, his technique is, it's like chocolate. Watching him ski is like eating chocolate. <laughs> so I'm trying to mimic his polling motions on the polling machine as I watch him and it's just, I love it. He is such a technical master and is so strong. You can't imagine the power that he generates uh, until you try it, until you're out there on skis trying to do what he's doing and you just realize just how impossibly strong he is. So in between my polling sets, I'm doing pull-ups, but trying to do muscle-ups and not a kipping muscle-up, not uh, a leg swinging, waist bending, but what they call an explosive muscle up where you're just launching yourself straight back and up. Um, and I'm about two thirds of the way there uh, because when I see Simon ski, just the power, the acceleration of his arms. Uh, so I think an explosive muscle up, if I can get myself to the point where I have the strength to do that, uh, yeah, I think there'll be big gains on the ski course. Anyway, it's a late start today. Uh, last night we watched a movie, so Oscars are coming up and I'm not a fan of the Oscars at all. Uh, there's a story there, I don't know if I'll share it. but. My mom wants to see the Oscar movie, so rather than a game night, we picked a best, uh, best picture nomination, which was Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. Wow, I don't know what I watched. All of us were so confused and upset to a degree. It was entertaining, but it was also just so overwhelming. It was everything, everywhere, all at once, but yet still not enough. And the only message that really makes sense to me when trying to process the film is that our youth have such an increasingly abundant plate of possibility in front of them that nothing really seems to matter anymore. There doesn't seem to be any purpose or deep meaning because everything is just handed to you and, and the possibilities are expanding every day and the path of least resistance in that state for a human being is nihilism. Uh, and I think Michelle Yeoh as the older generation, uh, a generation where you had to work hard to get things, um, really hard and there was meaning and purpose in that striving in that activity in that sense of I'm doing this I'm making something happen that she's trying to instill in her daughter this sense of meaning and purpose and that the mundane has value um, pick your project pick your battles and work hard at them and that's that's it that's life um, and we've basically created this nihilistic stew for the young generations. Uh, that's what it appears to be about. I really don't know, but that's the message that I think I got. Anyway, off to Sunday brunch, tofu scramble, and my dad is making some whole wheat and oat pancakes using our maple syrup and blueberries. Um, so yeah, all right. See you in a bit. Fox, you're gonna get a stiff neck sleeping like that. As usual, I ate too much for brunch. The tofu scramble had extra turmeric in it today, which made it taste better. The bitterness went really well with the broccoli. And our homemade maple syrup was a wonderful addition to my dad's experimental pancakes. <laughs> but, yeah, I got to be really careful with foods like that because I don't feel good and I don't feel good pretty quickly. And in the past, it would sink my day and my coping mechanism, my go to is food. So when I feel like this, my tendency is to eat more, which just makes me feel worse, which makes me cope more. 
eat more and feel worse until the point where in the past I would lie on the floor in agony, not being able to move and just trying to wait it out. And when I went raw, that was a big shift for me. Being vegan made a difference, but going raw had the biggest impact. And now I'm not raw, but I try to eat simpler, whole plant foods. Uh, and again, smoothies and salads. And the salads definitely help mediate the additional foods that I eat at night. So if I'm going to have some pasta, it's going to be a, a more of a whole grain or vegetable-based pasta, bean-based pasta, and then I'll have that with a salad. So it's a topping on my salad rather than just pasta. Uh, same with uh, just about everything else I eat for dinner. It's always on top of a salad. Uh, the salad is the main course for me. Busy day on the mountain. Not a bad view. It's been an interesting week. I'm still feeling a void in front of me after bailing on the world championships. I was planning on going to a race in Rangeley, Maine this weekend, but there was a big snowstorm, so I had to bail on that. But now I think I'm gonna go to a race in Jackson, New Hampshire, which is near Mount Washington, the White Mountains. This coming weekend, March 11th, that's a 22K skate. So I'm gonna put that on the calendar and uh, maybe do some hard stuff this week. Again, without a plan, we'll see if it happens. It may, it may not. I'm finding that my polling is getting a little bit more aggressive. It's just kind of happening. Uh, I'm finding myself putting on more weight on the polling machine. But I'm doing fewer pull-ups, more knees to bar, but fewer pull-ups. I haven't done dips in quite a while, but a lot more pulling machine with uh, some more weight. Um, and again, none of that is planned. It's just kind of happening. <laughs> so um, my training is starting to increase in volume, but it's been rather low for me. Um, and uh, we'll see. We will see. All right, I'll see you in the next one.